Okay, welcome to this episode of How You Got Rich. I've got a special guest, Jerome Maldonado, right here. We're in Puerto Rico. I said, come on my show. I want to interview. This isn't, if you've never seen this series, I interview people worth more than $10 million who have a very specific skill. They share how they became multi-millionaires, more than millionaires, multi-millionaires. They, one qualification or one minimum requirement, they have to be ragged to riches. You not only, Jerome, you're going to hear is a cool story because he was paid his way through college with network marketing, lost it all, and then built it back up within three years. He's worth way more than $10 million. He's done over 800 real estate deals. He's built over 300 homes. And we're going to talk about the theme here is how basically anybody with the right training can buy their first piece of land, small piece of land, get a contractor to come build a house and flip it in between four and 12 months for over $100,000. And here's the kicker, while you have another job, you can do this, doesn't even take 10 hours a week. Part-time. And once you get good at it, you should always do at least three at a time. Yes, it's, it's way easier. And way out of your profitable. 300 homes, how many have lost money for you? Zero. We've never lost never money. Never lost money. Even in 2008, you told Even me. Even in 2008, we didn't lose so, money. We still made profits. So good. Let's talk. Let's talk. This is exciting. Cool. The subject today is how you can make over 100 grand a year profit working less than 10 hours a week by buying a piece of land, building a house, having someone build it for you, and then flipping it. So, welcome, my man. Thanks, Thanks for Ty. coming all the way to Puerto yeah. Rico. <laughs> You're from New Mexico. A little background around Jerome. You know, he's done over 800 real estate deals, and he's built over 300 houses that he's built and sold. So he's a real expert. He's been in every aspect of real estate and uh, wanted him on the show because so many people nowadays are like, how can I make money? Is the best way to make money in multifamily, you know, apartment complexes, this, this, this. And one of the things I tell people is do stuff that not everybody's talking about. Yeah. I always say, you got, if you want to make real wealth, you have to go into a jungle that nobody's yet in. Because when too many people are in a jungle, it goes from a jungle to a forest. And in the forest, there's no money to be made because all the gold has been picked. So when you see everybody you know just saying, oh, just do this and now you'll make money in real estate, be careful. So you have a unique angle. So let's, just, let's, let's walk me through this. Let's say somebody's listening or watching. They want to make six figures. They have less than 10 hours a week because they have a job. They don't know. This works for somebody who even doesn't know how to build, right? Oh, it works with anybody. I mean, I didn't know how to build when I first got started. Yeah. I was, how did, by the way, how, let's get the background story. Did you find a mentor? What was kind of the way? No, I was in college. Before I got into network marketing in 1993, I was in college and I was just sanding drywall for my brother-in-law okay. and um, just scraping floors, laboring for him. And I got into network marketing for about four and a half years. Yeah. Uh, went through the whole mill works of network marketing, became his top distributor. And then the FTC shut us down in 1997. I had a year left okay. of college. So you were so, making money doing like multi-level marketing multi -level company. Marketing. Yeah. That's how you paid your way through. <laughs> well, I, I, uh, we, I did extremely well. I was making about $25,000 a month and I was a top distributor in, in the company we were in back in 1995, 96. That's real. 25,000 a month is good now. It was great. But at 95 then. with inflation, the way it is, that's like making a hundred grand, you know, a month, really a buying power. Like yeah. inflation is a real thing now. So with the FTC shut us down, I went to zero. It was yeah. temperature taking. I felt like I'd failed. So I went back to school because I needed, only needed one year left to finish. If I went back to the, to the University of New Mexico, or I could spend three years in Texas finishing my degree because I was living in San Antonio. Yeah. What was the degree you were going for? I was in pharmacy school. Okay. Parents yeah. wanted you to be a pharmacist? No, that was my thing. Uh, my parents just wanted us to go to college and get, a, get educated and yeah. go get a job. You know, they just wanted us to finish our degree. I don't think they really even cared what it was in. Right. And so when I came back, my brother-in-law is the owner of the company that we, that my brother-in-law was doing drywall for, and I was laboring for when I was in college prior, Yeah, went out of business for tax evasion. And I landed up uh, going with him to support him to get his contractor's license. Who, who my, went for tax evasion? My, the, our old boss that we oh, had worked old for. Boss. When okay. the, and my brother-in-law was doing drywall and metal stud framing at the time. Yeah. When I was a kid in college, 
going into pharmacy school. And his boss, his, about the time I moved back, their company got shut down for tax evasion. So I, I just went simply to go support him, yeah. to help him get his contractor's license. So I took the exam, I went into the school with him, and um, I landed up getting my contractor's license and he didn't show up that day to take his test. Yeah. So I started marketing jobs, commercial jobs, doing drywall and metal stud framing. Yeah. And um, we did about $1.7 million in gross revenue that year. Yeah. And I made a few hundred thousand dollars in 1998. And that's how I got into construction. It was completely by accident. I didn't know anything about construction, but I knew how to market and I knew how to sell. Yeah. So I was able to sell the work. And my brother-in-law, along with all the crews that I had labored for prior, they were working for me doing drywall metal stud framing. That was my introduction to construction. Okay. I still didn't know, without them, I didn't really know the trade. Yeah. And so I, a year later, I had some capital and I started buying rental homes and I hated the single family rental homes because I was managing them. Right, you got to deal with people. Just dealing with people. Busting down. I had a rental home in La Jolla, California. Listen to this story, not to interrupt you, but this is relevant, you'll like this. So these people that are living there write me a letter saying, can you be gracious to us? Wife just got cancer. We can't pay the rent. So they told me a whole sob story. So I was like, okay, I feel bad. I understand. Didn't pay rent. So I said, you can waive rent. One month goes, one month goes. Finally, I had a guy, a friend of mine managing the property while I was traveling. I said, okay, it's been like five months. He goes, oh, Ty, the law changed in California. We can hardly evict these people because they can claim that you, you know, had a verbal agreement, let them stay. So finally we got rid of them after all this law. I ended up with almost a year, no rent paying me. Good gosh. When they leave, they trash graffiti, kick holes in all the wall. Yeah. That's how, you know, the old saying, no good deed goes unpunished. I was thinking, geez. So now, you know, that's why sometimes in real estate and in business, when you think you're going to be nice, you end up harming everybody. everybody. They didn't learn. They need to know the life lesson. Like, even if hard times yeah. hit you, you, you can't do that to people. Yeah, we dealt with it. So I lost, they lost, the whole world lost, lost. You know, I've been there. And, and so that's, that's why you hated. That's why I hated that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I hated that because that exact reason. Because I've dealt with the almost different story. Yeah. Different scenario, but very similar circumstances. Yep. And so I, I was dealing with that stuff in commercial and residential sectors. And anytime I bought stuff to renovate, there was unforeseen variables in there. And so I never knew what my exact profitability was going to be when we underwrite the deal. Like there's a lot of people that fix and flip homes. Yeah. You open up walls and you think you're going to make forty, fifty thousand dollars And all of a sudden you have a, a $20,000 expense for electrical or heating yeah. and cooling. You land up with a ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 profit if you're lucky. Yeah. And what I loved about new construction was that I, I could see, I could see the variables from the time you get started, right? Right. It's the variables are the same on almost every bill, with the exception of the land. Yeah. And so, if you can mitigate the variables on the land, your profitability is almost consistent every time you build. Yeah. Um, as long as you go through specific steps of checking, like comps, and you know, yeah. there's a process. There's a process to it. But the variables are less, and the, and the profitability is better yeah. and more stable, and and you don't have to worry about uh, you know, unforeseen circumstances, you know, you just learn how to properly vet out the right pieces of land and what you do. And, and then you don't have to babysit the yes. contractors because a lot of contractors don't want to work on fix and flips because they're yep. a lot of work. Um, they know that there's variables. And, uh, and so you go in new construction so much easier, right? You know, this whole concept of how you can make six figures, more than a hundred grand profit working 10 hours a week. So it can be a part-time job. And you do that, the simple system that you've created for people who don't even know, have never done it before, buying a piece of land, building a house, flipping it for profit. Yeah. And it sounds overwhelming, but there's a system to stuff. And like you said, you didn't even start. Your dad wasn't in construction. Your mom was in construction. You taught yourself this now. And we're going to talk about how, let's talk about like the one, two, three step that is realistic for average everyday poor person. First question is, how much capital does somebody need to do this? Can you start out with $1? Do you need $100,000? Do you need $10,000? It's kind of a realistic... Yeah, it, realistically, it's always better when you have cash, right? It's yes. always better when you have capital and good credit. But there's a bear of entry. And so even somebody, like I got some young kids that work with us, and I tell them, look, 
you're not going to make maybe a hundred grand on your first bill. There's a bear of entry. Yes. But with the right business concept in any trade, in anything, you you can sell it to somebody for private money. Yes. And with private capital, even if if you have to give up fifty percent of your equity, for example, yes. to an investor, uh, when there when you have a business model that makes sense, there's there's so much capital out there. Yeah. Even family members. Yes. Uh, would do as long as you're a reputable person. Yes. Um, to make a, an ROI. So instead of maybe making having the potential of making $120,000, what if you only made 50 or 60,000 yes. on your first build? Yeah. And the question is, you know, what are you doing right now that that'll net you 50, 60,000 dollars in 12 months working part-time? Yeah. And so there's a bear of entry. And and is scalable. And scalable. You've done over 300 of these. Yeah. In fact, you were telling me even though you have multi-million dollar construction businesses, you actually created the vast majority of your wealth from owning real estate, the actual property side. That's Early on, this, buying land and building houses is what made me a millionaire in my in my late twenties. Yes, because, and this is a millionaire, not in twenty twenty two, a while back. That's yeah, like this being is worth in, five or ten million. Yeah, early two thousands, really yeah. early two thousands. And so when you when you have a million dollar business, which we did at the time, pouring cement. We, uh, the ca it's cash flow, but you yes. know, it's hard to acquire that money, save it, and then see it tangibly at a million dollars. And you're a lot worse taxation. Active income has worse taxation in almost every country in the world, yep. basically. Because I do business, all, I've owned companies all around the world. Every country has worse taxation for income versus capital gains. Yes. Property, you take a piece of property, you improve it, you sell it for more, you're gonna get the best taxation, whether you're in Sweden, you know, Florida, California, Canada, every country is basically that way. And what's cool is when you, when you go out and you start creating these assets and you start building them out and when you get, when you sell them, you get a large paycheck at one point, at one time. Yes. And when you realize is after you learn the process, like the, pro and like anything, the first one you do is always going to be the hardest. Yes. Because it's an unforeseen process. So I always tell people, don't, don't go in big, start off slow. This isn't get rich quick. This is, this is something that you can do that's really tangible. Yes. Once you learn it, even your second build sometimes, because you're going to learn, you're going to have mistakes on your first build, but because there's so many distractions because of fear, emotional distractions, unforeseen circumstances, uh, you know, your first one, you're semi-distracted. So I always tell people, the second one, you actually learn more on than your yeah. first because now you have some clarity. Yeah. You're not as scared. The fear factor's gone. And so your profitability goes up. Now you can scale. Yes. And so when you're able to do two or three of these and you're making 200, 300,000 and every, every time you build two or three at a time, the process becomes simpler when you have two or three going at a time. And yes. the profitability goes up. Yeah, because you're basically taking, you got the same set of contractors if you're doing it right. Yep. But so that first question for somebody listening, you know, and you've got a whole, you have a whole mentor program where you mentor people, but I'm getting it on this free show so people can learn here for free. If you know nothing about houses or construction, this still can work for you. It does, because that, that's why I started. I, there was a guy in a Harley, we were pouring concrete down the street and I'd see this guy show up in a button down shirt on a Harley Davidson wearing rings, probably in his fifties, tattooed up, looked really cool, just a you know, cool looking guy. And I'd see him just roll up and we're over here beating ourselves up, pouring concrete driveways. And this guy rolls up looking clean and does a 10 minute walk around on this house for like two, three days in a row. And I see him leave. And, he, and then a couple of days later, I see the same thing. And I, so I woke up and I ask him and I go, hey, are you building this house? Are you the builder? He tells me yes. I said, what do you think you're going to make on this thing? He goes, well, and he was, he was Australian, so he had a real heavy Australian accent. He's like, well, well, mate, I, I, I sure as hell hope I'll make between eighty to 100000 on this damn thing or it's not going to be worth my time. Yeah. Real good guy. And um, I said, you're going to make eighty to 100000 How long do you think it takes to you to build that thing? He goes, he goes well, about four months. And so I started, I, I thought, shit, this guy. So I started going through my income, what we were making at the time, which was probably about twenty, thirty thousand 30000 a month. In, in doing cement work, breaking our back. And I thought, man, if I can double down and just do one of these, yeah. I would double my income. Yep. And, um, and this guy's never here. I yeah. can do this on the side. So I landed up buying the lot, four lots down from there. So you learned from this guy. You're so like, I just watched making 80 to 100 grand. I'm going to make it. Yeah. Well, and I'm a little more bold than most people. So most people need a little bit of assistance. And that's, that's where 
what we're doing educationally wise helps people. I, right. I was kind of, I was kind of, you know, the black sheep and I just kind of, I'd go do my own thing, right? I, and I, By I the figured, way, I've noticed as I interview people worth a lot of money, one thing, they're not procrastinators, A. Number two, they're a little more bold. Even if they have fear, they know how to control yeah. it a little bit. And number three, they always have a roadmap from somebody else. Those are the three things right. I've learned about wealth. They don't, people, it's not where you're born, it's not what country you're in. Where it's, you from. are you not a procrastinator? Procrastination kills more hopes and dreams than anything. Yep. Number two, if you're controlled yep. by fear, you always lose to somebody who isn't. Yes. And always. then number three, there's always another human that lays out the path. In this case, you're pouring construction and some Australian guy pulls up, he's not sweating at all, and he's making the big bucks. So you follow him, so you buy, a, how much did you make on that lot? What were, was this in New Mexico? He was in New Mexico, yep, over in Rio Rancho, right by Intel. By yeah, Intel, okay. Yeah. So so I literally bought four lots down, I buy the land. And how much was it, you remember? I paid like $35,000. 35 grand, lot. okay. And um, I sold the house for just under 400,000 at that time, it was about 385,000, give or take. And what and was the build cost? I, oh God, I don't even remember. It was inexpensive. I mean, what did you think you made? What did you think you made? I made a little over eighty thousand on that property. On eighty thousand. And how long did it take? It took me a little over four and a half months. Just really? shy of five months. From yep. purchase to finish. And did you just shy of five months? Who built it? I did. I was a GC. Gotcha. I had a general contractor's license at that so time. So you're a general contractor. You brought in people to do various parts of it. One hundred percent of it. Other other than the. So you weren't work. actually swinging a hammer. No, and we weren't doing foundations at that time. So even the foundation I had to hire out because- Because that's important for people listening. Some people go, I don't know how to be a general contractor. Think of it as a quarterback on a football team. Yep. Think of it as a coach. You, can, you don't have to learn how to swing a hammer. You don't have to learn how to buy lumber, pour a foundation. You need to learn how to coordinate and manage humans. And Will Durant, who I think is the wisest person, I saw Elon Musk recently, started telling everybody to read Will Durant. I was like, I've been telling people that for 10 years. Elon, I got you beat on that. But Will Durant says, the men who can only manage, the men who manage men will always manage the men who can only manage things. So like if scene. you can manage humans, you'll do better than if you're just somebody who can, you know, just manage a thing like I swing a hammer. Of course, Will Durant also said, and the men who manage money manage all. So eventually you become a capitalist. Yes. Or maybe not cap. Capital is not a good word. Eventually you become a resource allocator. That's yes. what you got to say nowadays. Resource allocator. Resource, resource allocator. allocator. First yeah. time I've heard that. <laughs> resource. Like that's that. really what, like that. what it's supposed to be. I mean, you know. So you made. So then the eyes were open. Yeah. I and you've done 80, over. You've done 250 more of those. Have you ever lost money on one? I've never lost money. Not even in 2008 or nine. And it, it has to do a little bit with our with our business model. And yeah. I didn't. And I always tell people, I didn't create this business model for them. I created it for me. Right. And I create part of and, and part of part of business and finding things out is a little bit of luck, right? Yes. Like I didn't I didn't methodically go into the business model um, thinking that I hit the perfect asset class. It just so happened that I did, and I've stayed in that asset class forever. And yeah. that asset class that I hit is more recession proof than any other asset class because it's the asset class where our moms and dads live, our yes. grandparents live. Um, it's somebody always going to need a home. Someone's always going to need a home. And when, when a compression in the, in the market, there's a recession, there's financial issues nationwide that that's where things change economically for the mass majority of the working yes. class professionals yes. or working class people, not even professionals, just, just working class individuals. So when you hit that market, that's, if you hit that market, you're more subjected to dealing with bankruptcies, foreclosures and, and dealing with, with less affluent buyers, where if you hit just over that just over the affluency of the average person, yes. you have more stability because those people, like in 2008 for take, for example, it wasn't, it was all the entry level homes because the yes. median home was eight, 180 to $250,000 at that time. Right. Those were the homes that were going into mass foreclosures and, and, and the big multifamily, the secondary home market. But the, the asset class that got hit, it got hit, but it got hit least was the ones that were being sold to the upper middle class Yes. or people that had stabilized fixed incomes that weren't affected by economic changes mm -hmm. due to banks, mortgages, and so forth. And those were people like our parents who are, like my parents now are in their 70s, but at the time they were in their early 60s. Yes. And now, or like our grandparents, and people that had fixed incomes where 
they weren't worried about going to their job. They had layoffs and so yeah. forth. And so we've stayed in that asset class. A lot of alternative lifestyle people that don't have the expenses of children for the most part a lot yes. of times. So you um, need to know the right type of home to build. You don't necessarily want to build you know, the lowest end homes or even the highest end homes. Exactly. You can get caught both. You like that kind of mid mark, a little bit above the median price. It's been a very comfortable place for us because our returns have been solid. Even, even in the worst case scenario, my worst profitability in all the homes I've ever made was $38,000. And part of that was my fault because we made the kitchen wrong. Mm. And um, I had to put about another $10,000 into changing the cabinets and countertops because during the recession, you, when, when you have market compression, people have options. And if when it's a buyer's market, they're gonna go after exactly what they want. And they'll wait and shop to find exactly right. what they're looking for. No, It's it, funny, humans are emotional. And when you're yes. building homes or, you know, I own a lot of businesses, do e-com, I'm always thinking of that emotional side because so many big. people, a lot of people who follow me are more logical. Like, and it's funny, even my business partner, Dr. Alex Mayer, he's more, you know, he's got a PhD, he's basically a mathematician. I'm like, Alex, take whatever you think about this, do the opposite. That's what most people are thinking. <laughs> so like when you build a home- It's 100% emotional. For you need kitchen, yep. bathrooms, right? <laughs> Just simple stuff. It's like, I swear you could sell a house that's about to fall down it's like you got balsa wood studs in the wall, but if the kitchen's right, they'll be like, "I want this one." Yep, it sure will. <laughs> and we, and we, and in married couples, ninety-nine percent of homes are purchased by the women, not the. Not oh the yeah, husbands. yeah. Don't be don't yep. be building for the men. No, and so it doesn't matter what the men like. You got to you got to think you got to think on the emotional standpoint of a wife. Listen to this next question because it's important. When you build a home or renovate and flip an existing home. What would you say are the three most important places? Number one's kitchen. Number one. What are the two? What are some ones people don't think about? Because a lot of people be like, "Oh, kitchen's important." What are two other things when you're designing, building, renovating, that a couple extra dollars here end up making a house a lot more valuable? The views are always a selling point. That's always okay. one of the most things. When people walk to the front door and they they're in the family room, the kitchen, um, the the openness and the views. Uh, so the view's always, out the window. The view's out the window. Do you like vaulted, like this place right here we're in right high now. Ceilings. You like high ceilings? People resale rise, and I know I've heard you talk about this with yes. the Amish. Yes. You know, they, they, it, you sleep better with a lower roof. Yes. But it's the opposite for resale. Yes. People like massive. It's just everybody, bigger is better, right? Yes. And so everybody has this bigger is better mentality. So wide open floor plans, higher ceilings yes. are always better. For those of you starting out, don't be building a 22 foot yeah, vaulted ceiling living room, yeah, don't, but don't going above one. average, then you were saying views. So what do, what do people, you know, one of my mentors taught me, Ty, people love what's called the savanna. He said, it's actually built into human DNA. It goes back to our hunter gatherer roots. He said, you need to have a tree, grass, and ideally water. If you can get those three, it can be a pond, it can be a little creek, it could be an artificial something. It's actually built, and it's called the savanna effect. Scientists, evolutionary biologists and psychologists talk about this. So what do you look for? I mean, you're in New Mexico, there's no ocean. You try to get the mountain views. Mountain views, mesa views, city lights yes. uh, at night. So, because every, demographically, obviously, there's gonna be differences. Yes. But it, it's the funniest thing. We, I have a f unfair advantage of learning this stuff because we, we have the concrete end of our business, which we have both the residential and the yes. commercial. People could be in a pre-programmed community. Yep. And they'll they'll go up on a hill all the way on the far side of their house and say, I want a patio right here yeah. because I have a view. And you're looking through six different homes, 10 different yeah. trees, and you have like this little sliver of a view. But they still like it. And they go, I want that view. Yeah. And I'll sit there and I'll look at it and I'll go, you gotta be kidding me, but they love it. Yeah. And that's the big selling factor for them is. So when you're looking at, view. when you're scouting out the lots, People in your mentor program, you're like, because you actually do some one-on-one -on -one with people. Yep. You're like, don't just go the seemingly best one. Because sometimes people go, okay, you know, a cul-de-sac is better. Or, you know, but but a cul-de-sac with a bad view might yeah. be much worse than a through fair with a nice view, like you said. Even if So you're saying even sometimes views through buildings people are okay with? And, and sometimes it's not even... The, the good view that they're looking for, it's the bad views that won't sell the house. So for sake yes. of example, we, there's, um, 
there was a lot that one of the people in our mentor program came to me and there was a, a water drainage channel that yep. everything drained to. The lot was gorgeous, the views were gorgeous. But I asked him, I said, so, in, but the, the drainage channel was ugly. And yeah. I thought to myself, okay, someone emotionally driving up to this place, yeah. pulling into the driveway, yep. they, that's their first view. What's, their fir what's yeah. the first thing that's coming to their mind? Because it's yeah. an emotional purchase. It's like for sewage almost. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's an emotional purchase for people. So you, you get a husband and wife before they even get to the kitchen and they, they drive up and that's the first thing they yes. see because the, drive, the driveway pulls in. I told them, don't buy that lot. I don't care if it's cheaper. Yeah. I don't care if the house next door comps on it because you, you yeah. buy that lot. That's the first view that person's yeah. going to see. There's one way in, one way out. Yep. So th that's a perfect example. And people are fickle consumers. In this case, your customer, you know, the saying, the customer is always right. What that means is it doesn't mean that on a justice basis, the customer is always right. It means the customer is always right about what they want. Yeah. So if you they think, are. well, don't worry about this little drainage channel because look at how nice the kitchen is. They've already made their decision before. They've even walked in the house. You know what's crazy? In a courtroom situation with a jury, they've done studies over and over. When the defendant and, and the you know the victim uh, when the defendant and the victim walk out, the jury decides. 90% is decided in the first five minutes by how they look. Yeah, and I believe that. And then people just listen to the trial for what their pre, kind of pre-made decision was. They're just looking to back it up. Yeah, so that old cliche, you only get one chance to make a first impression, is basically you can overcome a bad first impression. They say it takes about a year. So yeah. you know a lot of guys are like, yeah, I met this girl, now we're married. When I first met this woman, you know, you hear her side. She's like, I didn't like him at all when I met him. But he grew on me for like a year or after a year or two. I'm like, that's a dangerous way to do it because you act like an idiot when the woman first met you. So if you want to cut two years off the cycle here, you need to go out and actually get the first impression to be the strongest. So for, what's another thing? What about closets? What about you know, master bedroom configuration. So we've what? changed a lot of that stuff. That stuff's evolved. I'd say that that's l less important than, than def definitely less important than the views, definitely less important than the- um, The kitchen, right? Than the kitchen. But mas master bathrooms and closets are important. And I'll tell you, like one of the things that we've done with the closets is that because of the, the uh, market that we hit, we've made the master bedrooms a little smaller and given them to the closets and we put all the dressers, everything in our yeah. in the closets um, because people do like that, that um, freedom to roam. And if you guys have ever noticed in a lot of homes or apartments or hotels or anything that when it feels cluttered and, and you can't get around dressers and end tables, um, people hate that. And um, so you stick that in the closet. Now you build it in. We build it into the walk-in closets on a lot of our homes. Now there's an exception to that. We're building in Washington State. Those houses are are more cottage style. They're smaller. They're yes. 1,500 square feet. Different market. Different asset class. But in a in a traditional 2,500 square foot home, on average, that a, a family of four or five is going to live in, people like that. They they like stuff tucked away where they can have their laundry. Yes. Um, we, we do these wraparound floor plans and they've been a hot selling point. And it, this, this took me several years to learn in multiple homes of building yes. to do these wraparound floor plans. But people like the ease of pulling into their garage, dumping off their groceries, yep. or, or having like this circular floor plan where multiple rooms can go to a laundry room and they don't have to walk. You ever walk into a house, you have to walk all the way in yep. to the house, to the master room. They have to walk all the way around just yes. to get out the door. So we do these wrap around floor plans and it's just a convenient way. People love that. Women love that. Yeah. Because they think about it. You got to think about it in perspective to a family with kids, someone walking in with a car seat, a child, um, groceries, yeah. book bags, yep. laundry, just everything. And um, those wrap around floor plans with uh, these big butler pantries and stuff that we do mm -hmm. are, are huge selling points. And it's, they're not that expensive to build. No, they don't cost You got stuff more. that costs you a architect. couple thousand dollars and add 20,000. One thing that you have to learn in any type of business you do, you know, whether you have nine, you know, I, I, I'm the CEO of a company and that I own and we're doing, you know, nine figures. So way over a hundred million in revenue, even in that business, going back to when I started, when I had my first business that made me $120,000, it's still the same thing. You're thinking not like the masses, the masses think about money as expense. The wealthy think about money as Okay, I deploy, how much do I get back? On a $16 million house, you drop an extra 70 on, now 
if you're a beginner, do not drop 70,000 on it. You shouldn't be <laughs> building any house with an elevator if it's your first go around. I've been, I did my first real estate deal in 2006. So I've been doing a long time. I haven't done as many home builds. Jerome's the master there has done. Anytime somebody's done more than a hundred of something, they're good. And when you've done many hundreds of things, but that's an example. I'm not thinking 70,000, who cares? It's yeah, so 70,000 might add for, to me, if I'm coming into a house and it has a nice elevator in it. Now elevators separate homes from mansions. Yeah, they do. You know, my, where we met at the Beverly Hills place, yeah. That thing had a real elevator in it that went multiple floor and, and that separate. So 70,000 in an elevator is going to at least add three to 500,000 of value. Easy. And the resale, and here's the biggest thing is that most people think in perspective to the market that we're currently living in. And yes. currently as we're recording this video uh, and this podcast, it, we're sitting in unprecedented times. We're see, sitting here historically, in, in the longest gap of a, a comp market compression and a recession that we've seen in since the 1950s. And you can't think like that. When, when you're building, one of the biggest things I tell people is you have to, all, in real estate in general, you underwrite deals, you build for the worst and yes. you profit for the best. Yes. Because if you build for the worst if, and, you, and you set yourself up in, under a worst case scenario, you always have profitability. Yes. And so you have to think about these things. These are really important. Just these small little things that we're talking about, like yeah. even that elevator. Because if there's a house next door, we go into a market compression, taxes change here in Puerto Rico. We have an elevator. We don't have an elevator. The one next door yes. does. And the That's house right. is listed for half a million dollar difference. They're going to pick the one with the elevator yes. because of the amenity. Um, if you have the di if the difference between that kitchen during the, during the recession yes. was that the house, th they had options. And so this stuff is super important. And the only way you learn this is by doing it. Yep. And so instead or of having, a mentor or both. Yes. Best thing you can do is have a mentor that watches you do it. Yes. That's like jujitsu. Yes. I do jujitsu. Best way to jujitsu is you definitely have to have a mentor. Nobody ever taught themselves jujitsu. You can't just intuitively go, well, okay, if I do, because most of jujitsu is counterintuitive. Yes. It's and counter then number two, too. on top of that, you need, so you need a mentor and a number two, but if you only have a mentor talking to you like, you know, on a podcast and you never actually go into the gym and compete, you're also not good. People love the thought. I think it's the rugged American individualism where you're like, I didn't need anybody. But as I began to study wealth over the last 10, 20 years, nobody does it alone. All the smart people I know are big. They're like teams. But the press only writes about, like Elon Musk, there's a great book that just came out called The Founders. And it's about Elon Musk's first big business he did. He sold a small business, but where he made his big, first time he made over hundred million was PayPal, okay? But people don't realize there's a group, he had so many people in it with him that it's now called the PayPal Mafia. Okay, it was a group of like 10 people that all these kids, they were young. Elon Musk was one of them, but you also have Peter Thiel, who's now one of the wealthiest people in the world. You have a guy that, a friend of mine named Ken Howry, who started Founders Fund. It was at one point the second biggest venture capital company in the world. But my point being is, even somebody like Elon Musk, this guy was in a big gang, a big crew of people that helped him create that wealth. So. Some people were smarter than him on certain things, and now he's the richest man in the world, but nobody's a self, nobody's a self-taught, man. It's just Nobody a myth. Is. And if you are, I love the fact that the world, by the way, self-sufficiency is one of high self-sufficiency is one of the seven forms of narcissism. Whenever I meet people, you know, that are like, oh, I don't need anybody, I'm like, you know, you're squirting on the narcissistic personality inventory. They have a whole section of self-sufficiency. So it's good to be an individual rugged individual but people take it too far i'm like you want to build your first they house do. on your own are you insane there put it this way there's a zero percent chance you don't make a ten or twenty thousand dollar mistake oh easily you'll, you'll <laughs> cut your profits you do something wrong you can cut your profits in half in fact i'll even get comments people say there's no way there's so many variables in this and and you're 100 right there's too many variables in it if you're doing it on your own because you don't know them you don't yes. know those variables and to your point the reinforcement any of us that are entrepreneurs, we've all had mentors of some, some type, way, shape, or yes. form. I've been paying for mentorship my entire career. I learned that in, in direct sales. But even when the recession hit and I was trying to fill commercial property, 
I, I started buying Subway stores to you yes. know, that you mentioned earlier. And you were the biggest franchise Subway in owner in New Mexico. Colorado and, yeah. and, and, and uh, central New Mexico. Yeah. And when I did that, I did it to, to be able to build out an infrastructure um, so I could hire management yes. and afford, have the affordability to do so under a business model. But I, I built the business model myself, but I didn't, I didn't invent the, the, uh, the sub in, in to, to your point. Yeah. I, I got an opportunity to meet Fred DeLuca, the founder of Subway, and he wanted to come meet me. And his question to me, it was funny because he was wondering how I was taking 13 year old stores that had never done over $4,000, $5,000 a week. And I take them to $9,000 in just less than 60 days from owning them. In fact, I have that video on your knowledge yeah. society. Yeah, we shot a video yeah, on that on years how to ago. Go from zero to six figures. Yeah. And, and one of the things I told him when he came out and he wanted to know, he goes, he goes, Jerome, how did you take so many of these stores and take them from, from never making over $5,000 a week, 13 year old stores and take them to $9,000 a week in, in such a short period of time? What are you doing? Yeah. And I told him, I said, Fred, when I got started in the subway business, I was busy. I had so much stuff going on. I was battling the recession. I didn't put these, I didn't put these stores in my buildings because I wanted them. I, I, I needed them. Yeah. I said, the reason I picked Subway over all the other franchises, because everybody asked me, I looked at Hagen dazs I looked at Smash, uh, uh, Smash Burgers. I've looked, I looked at Panera Bread um, before mm -hmm. they had even come into New Mexico. I told them, I, I picked Subway because I wanted a duplicatable system. Yes. It wasn't my way. It wasn't, it wasn't Ty's way. It was Subway. Right. And it was Fred DeLuca's way. I told him all I did is I went to your, I went to your Subway University in Milford, Connecticut. Yep. And I paid attention. I had to be away from my, my newborn son for two full weeks and my family for two full weeks to do this. I don't know what everybody else has going on in their life, but I paid attention for two weeks and I took notes, passed the exam, went in there and I came back and I kept asking everybody. One, the questions I kept asking everybody is, what makes the difference between good stores and bad stores? And, and the, the consistency was good bread, fresh bread, hmm. and, um, and, and implement, basically implementing the system. Yeah and learning how to prevent theft. So I just took, I told him, I, I took your system verbatim and I duplicated yes. it. And through duplicating your system, and obviously there's some marketing in there, right? Right. Like customer service. You added your own magic to it, but the core, the core was basically was the mentor, the founder of Subway was yep. in effect your mentor because he built a system out. It's great, you it know, there's a great book um, and basically it talks about the success. 90% of small business owners who launch their own business fail. Yep. But 90% of people who buy a franchise succeed. Yeah, Isn't that crazy? It's a, like in McDonald's, I think there was only two McDonald's franchises that failed in a year. I was just looking at one year, I forget what year it was. It's only two in America that failed. Because if you got a McDonald's, you not only got a brand name, but more importantly is this McDonald's University yeah. And this McDonald's kind of just, operating it, manual. So that's what people need. That's why I yeah, do these is. interviews. I'm like, what's your manual to making money? Yep. And, and I tell people, like, I, I didn't build this, this out for them. I, I, this was, when I figured this out and it was like, uh, and, and it was, and that light bulb went on, I was like, holy shit, I can duplicate this. And I literally, once I did the first two, I sat back and I go, man, I can scale this and net a million dollars if I just do this. Yeah. And I just, I, I implemented that strategy, and in two years, I, I, I had over a million dollars taxes paid in the bank, and I was building these things cash from the revenue I made building. Yeah, so you, you, that was the first time. How did it feel? That's the question I always ask everybody in this series. You know, how you got rich, people with more than $10 million net worth, you're way over that, but what did it feel like the first time you looked in your bank account and you saw a million dollars deposited? It was gratifying because was it as good as you thought, or was it just like ah? Oh, it was like Michael Jordan's like when I won my first championship, I thought I'd be so excited. I wasn't so excited. <laughs> Were you super excited? Mark Cuban told me he was in his underwear all night watching the TV screen, the the monitor when he became a billionaire, and he was pretty excited. Billion is a whole nother level. But when you got the first million dollar deposit, did you go out to a nightclub to celebrate? I've done different things like. I always said, I remember thinking years ago, what would it like to make them? I, I can still actually remember where I was sitting. I was in Raleigh, North Carolina. I go, I wonder if I can ever make a million dollar revenue business. I was like, that would be crazy. And then I, so I figured I'd make a million dollars in a year. And then once I did that, I was like, I wonder what it's like to make a million dollars a month. 
You make a million dollars a month. And then I was like, I did that. And I was like, I wonder what it's like to make a million dollars in a day. And I did that. And then I've done it a million dollars in an hour. Yeah, I remember that and one. And now I'm like, I haven't done a million in a minute yet. That is the goal. It's like, well, how can I make a million bucks in, a in 60 seconds? And then I guess once you do that, you're like, Jeff Bezos, I think, makes $3 million a minute or a second or something. And I'll, then it'll be like, I wonder if you make a million. And by the way, I think most people, you don't need to play that game that much. But so anyway, going back to this, a million dollar, your first deposit. Where were you? Do you remember it? Yeah, I, I, I do remember it. And I remember going to Vegas. It's funny that you asked that question because this Rolex right here, I bought in 2001. It's a centennial version. It did, okay. And it's more than just like a watch to me. It's, everything that I buy is, a, is in milestones. Okay. So I do it in milestones. And that's it's, cool. And it's so that's a milestone me. watch? It is. This is when I bought what my, was made the my milestone? first million. 2001. I made a million dollars. I remember nice. calling my wife. I went to, uh, I went to Vegas. My brother-in-law, <laughs> well, he's not, he wasn't my brother-in-law at the time. So my, my soon-to-be brother-in-law back then was, uh, was coming to Vegas. And I remember I, I'd made a million dollars. I knew it like that, that within a few weeks of this trip. And I remember walking in the Bellagio Hotel, going into Tristani's, the, the jewelry store, the Rolex store, the still in Bellagio today. And I remember looking at the counter, and when I saw this watch, I was like, I gotta have that. That was my goal, and I hadn't even shopped them yet. Yeah. And um, I called my wife, and I said, when is, when is Adrian coming to, to uh, when is he coming into Vegas? And she goes, tomorrow. And I said, can you give him, can you give him 90 some hundred dollars in cash and have him bring it? And, he, and you gotta think, this guy's 25 years old, yeah. and he's carrying $10,000 in cash, it's 2000, early 2001. <laughs> And he's seeing the dog trying to the, snip that thing in Pablo Escobar. And, uh, and if I had him do it in cash, I have no idea. I, I don't even think I had a credit card at that time that had over a 10, 000, enough of a limit right. to actually buy it. Because I had jacked my credit up do, um, in, uh, when, I let, when I got out of network marketing. Um, I lost my house. I lost everything. And oh, so, so that was just a so few you're years a later. You're a true rags of riches. So you made money, lost it all. I lost it all, ruined my credit. I had like a 460 credit score, like 25 lines of bad but credit. Building, but doing home, learning how to do homes is From, how you came back. That's how I came back. Yep. And it, well, I, I was pouring concrete. I, was, I had a good business too. But this was all within like a three-year period. So that's know? a good come up story. So the cement business and building homes brought you back from the dead back. financially. Yep. Literally. That's a crazy story. By the way, so as we wrap up here, a couple things I want to go over that I haven't got from you. Like the, I always like, what's the one, two, three formula? For somebody who wants to just do it on their own, forget it. Yeah. Some people are like, I don't need a mentor. We talked about one, two, three formula for somebody listening. What is it? So simplest thing. Is it, you know, how do you buy the lot? Do you go to the most expensive part, the poorest part of town? mid-level do you look for one acre half acre in general like what's a general formula that works well for the lot i don't have a parcel size that's right. not that's not important everything that's important is based on on comps comparable re real estate that has sold and traded within a 12-month period in that specific area gotcha that fits so you, do you want to pay 80 percent of that 50 percent of that or you'll pay full let's say the average home is one acre in that area and it went for $30,000. Do you have a kind of a system in your mentor program or okay, come in and try to get it for 20 or just pay the full 30? No, if the, if the price is right in, in the market, let's say it's, it, it is like it is today and it, it, you may be watching this video in a, in a market recession. Yeah, uh, but just know, say but, now where it's not now. a total recession, yeah. Yeah, so typically rule of thumb is that the lot should not cost more than 20 to 25% of the entire build or the, yes. the entire resale price of the house. Yeah, so if you're selling a property, if you're paying, for example, $25,000 for the lot, you, build you can build a $200,000 yeah. house or, yes. you know, because expenses, are, there's a lot more expense now. So, so you need to multiply it by, say, yeah. now eight. The it needs to support that. Let's say yeah. eight. Yeah. The, the, so the, so the, the, the land is where your profits really are. And if, you're going into an undeveloped lot. One of the big things is if there's infrastructure to put in, then the, the, the lot price has to come down. Yes. And so we teach people how to depict that. Right? Yes. And how to know. Point. You have to be able to, if you got to rezone it, got, don't start with one you have to rezone. No. No. <laughs> don't begin in that rezoning yeah, keep game. Keep it simple. I'll, I'll get people to come and say, hey, I want to build a house. I have this 10 acres. I think I can fit 
30 lots on it. Yeah, I got to go rezone it. Yeah, 18 yeah, I, I, years later, you'll have it rezoned. And yeah, built. you'll be broke. You'll, you'll be filing bankruptcy before <laughs> you get your first million. Uh, so I think we have a bird in here somehow, I've noticed. There is a bird living in here. That's good. It's a good sign, lucky sign. Yeah. The parakeet in Puerto Rico, a lot of parrots. They're, the bird gods are blessing this podcast. Thank you. Number two. For somebody who doesn't know anything about construction, your system teaches them, but somebody can do this on their own. You, you find have... contractors. How do you find and manage the contractors you've never done it yourself? That's a great question. That's, <laughs> That's where, where the, the rubber biggest, hits the road. Biggest variables right there alone. Because I know there's a lot of people that watch this. And if there's one thing I know, there's people sitting back at home watching this right now going, I'm not a contractor. How yes. do I build this thing out? And so I'll run through all of that. And there's multiple types of contractors because if you go in and you talk to one contractor and let's say they're building like custom homes like Chad's building this million dollar, this multi-million yeah. dollar home for us, not the right contractor to go build this, this model out because Chad's making over a million dollars profit on every house. He's going to do a bid model. He's sophisticated. Yes. They're, contractors are not, is, con, construction is not the most sophisticated industry. So there's different levels and different types of, of contractors that build out different types of asset class. So knowing how to vet out the right contractor that's one, dependable and then two uh capable yeah uh, is but important. not too greedy but not too greedy not, not if you greedy. get one that's a shark now when see i'm a greedy contractor yeah jerome and i are building really high end house and we have a lot next to it these are homes that can sell for over 15 million dollars there you probably want it's okay to have a little greeter or contractor because you want the best if you're building a two hundred thousand dollar home don't be getting you a guy that's used to building in Beverly Hills or he's going to take all the profit for himself. Yeah. So I'm going to tell I'm going to tell all of you guys what I told Ty and an old high school buddy of his this past weekend. Don't be building $200,000 houses. That's where the first yes. the first business model. You got you got to scale up from there. We got to be up So you want 350 450 ish. No way. We want to be we want to be just over now that there's been mass appreciation and mass inflation. Yes. The, the median home is three fifty to four hundred. We need to yeah. be over that. So you need to be yeah. someplace between five hundred and eight hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, because depending on where you are in the country, but yes. what you're basically saying is find the median for your county and be well and above just it. Be not well above it, just barely, just just over the top of that. Yeah, find the median, just go just slightly higher than that. Good. Then you're dealing with people with money. Yep. And when I say money, you're not dealing with wealthy people. You're dealing with people that are in middle class and just above the the, the middle class. Just in that upper middle class range. Yes. You're not getting wealthy people, but you can have a family that's make a husband and wife that are both making $120,000 a year, you yep. know? And in, in, in today's world, that's yes, pretty, you know, that's, that's pretty average for a working class family to be making six figures for a husband and wife. So quick recap, the one, two, three formula, know what to pay for the land in general. If you have to do any kind of rezoning or any kind of entitled, any kind of add-ons, use that to negotiate the price down with the seller. Be like, look, I can't put my house on here. The math doesn't add up. I negotiate big deals for a living. It's nothing wrong with being transparent. It doesn't always work, but it works sometimes when you give a logical reason. Like you're asking 25,000 for this lot. Here's my Excel spreadsheet. I can't pay that, but I can pay 18,000, you know? Yes. And you make your money pricing that. You need that price. That's how you make your money immediately. Number two, Watch your contractor. You don't want one too sophisticated that they're going to take all the profit in their bid. And you don't want one that's such a low ball that they're going to not care about the project and gonna, it's going to take two years to build. And then number three, as we were talking about, know how to price the home. Yes. Know how to price the it, home. It all has to do with uh, project management and financial management. Because project management and, and managing your finances is, is super important. So we have, and you get into that in the mentor oh, program. Yeah. You have a whole kind of turnkey spreadsheets. People can just use your stuff. You know what's funny about that is my dad's an accountant. Yeah. And uh, my dad, he built one house. Um, he built one house. It was our house when I was eight years old. And it's the only house he built, but I knew he did it from scratch himself. So when I started this, the same spreadsheet that my dad sat down huh. with me in 1998, we sat down. He came to, he came to my house and we sat down on my, on my computer, little old e-computer. So I could afford back then a little e-computer. I remember sitting down, he helped me build a little spreadsheet with the little formulas, adding up all the expenses. And we went through it step by step, yeah. just for the, the build, step by step contractors in the process of building it. And we just sat there, we went through the entire build and we added to it as I, as I did the first house. And that same spreadsheet is theirs for free when they come yeah. in and they work with us. And, and it's neat because That's it still cool. works So you today. get a multi-generational 
spreadsheet that works. Spreadsheet. <laughs> you have never even shared that with me. Do I have to pay for the mentor? I'm gonna pay for the mentorship. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna use tylopes.com slash Jerome podcast so I get a discount. We already invested in everything. <laughs> we already <laughs> have some deals. Like, I'm gonna get this for free. We're so invested. We'll get this free. No, we got lots. Of, I'm just joking. But anyway, <laughs> you know, I, and I'll leave everybody with this. We're actually gonna go to the gym here. I don't, I don't like to sit that much anymore. This is all, this is about as much sitting, sitting I do. Yeah, you and I both. Sitting will destroy the body faster than anything. But, um, so I walk to the gyms about three quarters of a mile. It's cool. I get my 10,000 steps, just walk to the Puerto Rico gym. Um, one thing I would just leave everybody with is this net worth system that I'm really been training people all around the world in. And it's called the 60, 30, 10 rule, 60, 30, 10. People, number one question I get, Jerome, is Ty, if you're 18 years old again and you got no money, what do you start with? And my answer is, I wanna learn the 60, 30, 10 rule. And that is the way to build your net worth, your actual wealth, is to have one main thing you do, that's 60% of your wealth creation. Okay, you have one, that's your main thing. You gotta focus on one thing. So if you're listening, maybe your one thing is e-commerce or maybe you have a high paying job, that's great. But then you need something that's teeny part of your net worth, but also diversify. That's the 10%. And in between you need the 30. So for me, I give you my, if you look at a pie chart of my net worth, you know, started at zero and now it is where it is and 60% is in e-commerce. That's where mine is. Okay. 10% is in real estate. Okay. Because e-commerce takes a lot up what I do, but I still believe you, I have to have 10% of my net for every hundred million dollars of my net worth. I want at least 10 million of it coming from real estate. And then 30% is kind of like my second job and with that's crypto. So my 60, 30, 10 rule is, E-commerce businesses, I'm running, you know, sites that we had, my, my e-commerce websites had 150 million visitors to the websites across all of them, Pier 1, Radio Shack, Steinmark, Dressborn, all this stuff, Ralph and Russo, all that, linens and things. So that's my main, that's, but I don't want that to be more than 60% of my net worth because the world changes diversification. Yeah, huge. Crypto, I've got Radio Shack standards, USV, co-founded, NFTs, that's 30. But realistic, even if you're listening to this and you're like me and you're mostly e-com or crypto, if you don't have 10% in something like real estate, you're crazy. I, I would say for most people, you want real estate to be in this portfolio. Like for I can't sure. even think of one human. Look at Bill Gates, but love him or hate him, He's been the wealthiest guy over the last 20 years. The most wealth has been Bill Gates in terms of year in, year out, being the wealthiest. He was 10 years in a row wealthiest person in the world. Guess who now owns the most farmland in America? Yeah, Bill Real Gates. estate. He owns 250,000. He's been buying up farmland under everybody's nose. So even he follows the 60, 30, 10 rule. That's something That's nobody awesome. teaches. So if you're listening to this, by the way, if you're really into real estate, you definitely should get this program because that 60%, when you look at a pie graph of your net worth, that 60% in real estate should be diversified, meaning it should be some new construction, probably some multifamily, and some raw land. Yep. Since real estate is only you know 10% of my portfolio, but but as my net worth grows, that 10% gets to be, I gotta do, that's why I'm trying to buy hotels and I'm, I own 1,300 acres of farmland. I'm very far behind. Bill Gates is 250,000, I'm coming for you, Bill. I'm one two hundred. I'm about one two hundredth away from you. He is a lot older than me, so give me a while and I'll see if I can catch him. But this home building stuff—if you don't have that, like some people are only into multifamily, you're crazy. And multifamily is like, great. And, and I, I build. But it. you don't want to put all your eggs no. in that basket. Economy changes, BS happens. You're stuck with one. Don't be a one-trick pony. Yeah, that's it. And, and I mean, that, even my diversification in my real estate portfolio is huge. I mean. We don't build as many homes as we used to at one point in time. We're building bigger assets now. And the reason is because of taxes. Yes. One of the best things about real estate is it's one of the best tax shelters yes. in the world. Legal tax shelter. Legal tax shelter. Don't you technically shouldn't use the word tax shelter. Well, we'll yes. say tax, tax favored. Fa <laughs> yeah, because it is. It's a IRS government. Did, did you, already talk, don't, don't use the yeah, word shelter, yeah. but. A, yeah, not tax Tax shelter. advantage. Yeah, the best, the, the, it, 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 the best asset class 
that has the best tax advantages to yes. it. Um, that are perfect, 100% legal. And um, it's are the known best by for the everyday other person. When yeah. some of you get real wealthy, there's other tricks up your sleeve you can pull besides yeah. real estate. Yeah. So you, can, you, can start, you can start doing some crazy, you know, government credits and there's things you can do with accelerated depreciation of private jets and all if you ever yeah. want to get there. But for the everyday ordinary person, there's nothing better than real estate. Real estate, correct. It's one of the best things. Or you living can. in Dubai. Yeah. Tax free. Or, or Puerto Rico. Tax cheap. Not free. Dubai is even, if you're not an American citizen, Dubai is pretty. And there's other places you can do that. Yeah. So the future is quick mentorships yeah. that drop, get you what you need to know. So get in Jerome's program, learn, make us goal in the next 12 months or less. You use his system, turn key, get his spreadsheets, get his cheat sheets, how to buy a little piece of land. If you don't have the capital, how to convince someone else how to do it. Because lots of people, the easiest thing on this earth to raise, I raise capital for hard stuff. Like, you know, you want to go, I bought, Bank, I wired $31 million to buy Pier 1 out of bankruptcy. That's harder because I'm like, I'm going to buy this stuff that already failed Stressed, yeah. and rebuild it. But real estate is that you could be 18 years old. You find a good piece of land. You people put together smart. a nice business plan. Your uncle will smart. give you the money yep. or a friend of your uncle because they're going to secure themselves with the property. Yeah. And you'll learn all that. They're I, not giving you, know. you the cash. They're going to put yeah. their name on it. And then you do a separate contract. In the LLC, you make yourself the, in the LLC, you can have a member managed or a manager manager. Make yourself the manager. You control the LLC. They're safe because they put the money, they wire the money basically not to you. So you can't go off and, you know, do hooker and blow in Thailand. You get the money, you put it into the piece of real estate and they're secured. If you mess it up, they at least have the property. So real yeah. estate, for those of you watching, they're all, uh, this is the, if you can't raise money, for a piece yeah. of real estate, build a house. You might as well just quit, get a job at McDonald's or something, or go, you know, you live in a TV. Raise it. We got so many affiliates that are working with us that are just qualified lenders that deal with this stuff. Yeah, there's, there's hard there's money so many lenders. Options. Yeah, there's so hard many money options. people. So many options. You can borrow from the mafia. I heard Pablo <laughs> Escobar's son's got just a little program. You don't pay back, plato <laughs> plomo. You either pay me back or you get a piece of lead in your in your in your uh, in your head. Chop off a few fingers. Don't don't do any loan shark money. That's right. If I got I got options, better options. Than yeah, that. it's like if you know Luigi who's gonna chop off a finger every time you miss a payment, do not do that. Better to be broke than lose fingers. So my dad's from Harlem. Their dad had that whole world <laughs> hammer your hand if you don't pay him back. Down you down. Anyway, before we digress too much, thanks for being on this episode of thanks, How You Got Rich. So hopefully you all learned something. Talk soon. <laughs>